This is part three of the interview with Dr. Richard Stemmler on past life regression. Dr. Stemmler is the director of the Warrington Inner Healing Center and a certified past life regressionist. He has a PhD in transpersonal psychology. In the previous session, we have looked at past life regression from a quantum mechanical perspective. We learned that time is not linear and our past, present, and future lives actually exist simultaneously. We also learned that we have the free will to make a change in every moment that will not only impact our present but also the past and the future. In this session, we are going to drill down further into the topic of free will to learn what it is, why sometimes, even when we know that we have free will, we cannot seem to get to where we want to be, and how we can change that. Thanks for sharing your time with us, Dr. Stamler. Our topic today is free will. So to get started, can you tell us how the concept of free will has changed from the Newtonian worldview to the quantum mechanical worldview? In a Newtonian world, if you believe in a real physical world that is the same for everyone, then what that ultimately leads to is it leads to a conclusion that we do not have free will. Because what happens with the materialists, the scientific materialists, is that, um, is that they believe that the human being is nothing more than an animal, and it's an animal that responds to any current or future stimuli based on what the response or the reaction was to those stimuli in the past. So it's upbringing. They believe when you come into the world, you're tabula rasa, meaning your mind is a blank slate. An experience writes its code into your mind, and that code then determines how you respond to any stimulus. And in that way, they don't believe in a free will. So I've got a couple quotes here that I think are really striking. Uh, so there's an artificial intelligence researcher, Marvin Minsky, and here's what he says. According to the modern scientific view, there is simply no room at all for freedom of the human will. And that's in quotes, that last part. Everything that happens in our universe is either completely determined by what's already happened in the past or else depends in part on random chance. Everything, including that which happens in our brains, depends on these and only on these. And, of course, one of the founders of the famous double helix in the DNA says, and he wrote this, this book called The Astonishing Hypothesis, Sir Francis Crick, you, your joys and sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are, in fact, no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You are nothing but a pack of neurons. So that's, that's classic scientific reductionism and its scientific materialism. So, so that's the problem with believing in a single uh, material universe. But if you get into quantum mechanics, you cannot believe in a single material universe. Um, and the early quantum theorists like Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger understood that and it just puzzled them. And one of the quotes by, and this is just um, uh, a paraphrasing of it, was uh, that he says, how could nature, nature possibly be that way? I mean, they fully understand, understood that it was so odd, that it was so different from the Newtonian worldview. And in my mind and other transpersonalists' mind, the reason it's that way is so that we don't have determinism. So in fact we have free will. So that at every moment we have a decision which is normally made unconsciously because we most people don't understand that that's, that's available to you. You have a decision on what to pick out of the quantum wave of all possibilities and make that real for you. And the real way you pick is based on the eyes and ideas and beliefs that you have. Consciousness picks. That's the inescapable conclusion on quantum mechanics, is that consciousness brings the world, your personal world, into being. And it does so at every split second, 10 to the minus 44 in scientific notation. And uh, so it happens every 10 to the minus 44 in seconds. And 
And normally we don't see, you know, it's like a AC light bulb that's actually flickering on and off every uh, 60 times a second is our mind doesn't see the off periods. So you think it's on all the time. Uh, our mind does not see our movement through probable realities in those split seconds. And so we believe that the world is fixed. But if you look at it closely, it isn't at all. And and your free will is to such an extent that at each moment comes, I mean, this has been expressed this way, channeled material, comes with an ent entire universe that's yours, that you live in. And, and each split second comes with its own past and its own future. And what that means is, is it provides an explanation or the causal mechanism for people, for example, that have stage four cancer, and then suddenly it's gone, total remission. They can't even see the tumors. And there are cases like that. Um, and of course, the medical community says, well, I can't explain it. Or it says, and, I, and I, <laughs> I've got a reference I can cite for that, which is fascinating. Um, there's a man, a laser physicist, uh, who was one of the co directors or co-researchers for the CIA of remote viewing. And uh, his name is Russell Targ, interesting guy. And Russell Targ, at one point, uh, from scientific data, uh, developed uh, liver cancer. And rather than going through the conventional medical protocols, he got with a psychic lady and sort of totally changed his life. And I don't forgotten what the period was, or whether it's three months or six months, but it was on that order. He went back in, and um, and the liver cancer was gone, totally gone. So here's the punchline. So the punchline is the doctor, of course, being rooted in a conventional reality, a Newtonian world, couldn't imagine that this somehow, because typically liver cancer is a death sentence. Um, I couldn't imagine that this spontaneously disappeared. So he said, oh, we must have made a mistake. That the diagnosis was wrong. There were smudges on the x-rays. I guess you didn't have it after all. Well, you know, that's not true. In terms of quantum mechanics, what happened was Russell Targ's reorientation about his life, where he's going, um put him into a probable reality where the cancer, in fact, never did occur. But, of course, the physician has the x-rays from this past reality, and, and he, he sort of ha he doesn't understand this quantum mechanics movement. And uh, so his explanation was, well, it must have been a smudge. There's no way it could just disappear. Of course, it can. And, of course, with each split second, that's, that's the ultimate freedom that you have is... Not only, I mean, we're quite willing to say, well, the way you think will alter your future, uh, but it also alters your past. And it's really interesting. Uh, physicists are, are quite happy to accept that the fact that quantum mechanics has allowed us to produce a lot of our, for example, the laser, a lot of our modern uh, technology comes through an understanding of quantum mechanics. But they refuse to accept what it means for personal reality. And that's the striking thing about quantum mechanics, and that's a, an article I'm writing. So one of the challenges I see with free will is, even though we understand it now, that we have the total freedom to manifest what we truly want, most of the time, though, it still doesn't happen that way. So can you tell us what is the other half of the story? You can operate out of a condition where normally you do not have free will. And that condition is when you operate out of ego. And that is because the ego is the conditioned portion of the self, that portion of the self that learns through the experience uh, in physical reality and then almost automatically applies the results of that experience. And by applying the results of the experience, um, blindly, which typically we do when we operate out of ego, um, we in fact at that moment do not have free will. We do not exercise free will. 
And realizing, one, that our reality is quantum mechanical, and realizing, two, that the other portion of the self, the greater portion of the self, I call it the right brain portion rather than the left brain portion, um, once you have that realization, you realize that, in fact, you have complete free will, and you're not bound by past conditioning, and you're not bound by the responses that that conditioning automatically generates. So what that means is when you felt stuck, when you couldn't seem to manifest what you want, you have to take a step back and ask yourself, what is it that you're doing at the ego level that's limiting yourself and can you go beyond that? Is that right? That's right. Uh, you're right. You, should, you need to go back two things. If your reality is not to your liking, and channeled material tells us this, um, and of course quantum mechanics does too, if it's not to your liking, then you have got to ask yourself the question, and the question is at the ego level, what is it in my past that is generating this outcome? That is, what sets of beliefs do I have that were created in the past through conditioning, through culture, through all of those means that generate a worldview? Um, you have to ask yourself, what is it in my past that created a, a belief structure that the outcome now is this outcome that I don't want? So whether it's uh, a spouse that's unsatisfactory, whether it's um, abundance that doesn't come your way. Um, I mean, there's two questions to ask. One is, what's the soul lesson? Because your experience is perfect at every moment to teach. And the second question is, if this is unsatisfactory for me, what is my belief structure that is creating this outcome? And then by changing the belief, and this is where the free will comes in, by changing the belief structure, you will, without a doubt, uh, change the outcome. So that's also how you manifest. Mm -hmm. what's, what's being created in your life, what's being manifested in your life, is a direct result of the belief structure that you have. So if you grow up believing, you know, as I did, if you grow up being taught life is hard, you only get ahead by hard work, you know, it doesn't come easy, then in your adult life, at the ego level, you'll, you will project that onto the world and reality, you'll collapse the quantum wave where that is your reality, where, you know, it's not easy to get ahead. You have to work really hard. You know, it's like some people say, life's a bitch and then you die. That's the belief system. That's the belief system you learn from childhood. So you go back and change that belief system and it will change the outcome. It, ha it has no choice. As one set of channel materials said, reality is a mirror. It's a mirror of your beliefs and ideas. Change the beliefs and ideas, the mirror will change. It has no choice. So in other words, when things doesn't happen the way you like, they're actually a good pointer, pointing directly at where you need to change. That's right. Absolutely correct. Yes. Wonderful way to say that. Yeah, it is a pointer. That's why, I mean, really, one of the ways to look at your reality is you are never a victim tossed around by circumstance. Circumstance is there to show you that something in your belief structure needs to change if the circumstance is unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, and there's a famous physicist that this said something close to this, the universe is a perfect learning machine. And if you realize that it, you have the option at every moment mm -hmm. to, in fact, change your experience, then it's really a wonderful learning machine. What are some of the typical life lessons for us to learn here? One of the huge life lessons is that your power, you have the power to create, to create your life. And when it appears that you are the victim, Often the lesson there is you have negated, you have given up, you have compromised your own power, and you can change that. Um, sometimes, I mean, there's various life lessons. Sometimes the life lesson is, look, we're all one, so don't be racist, mm -hmm. because 
uh, the counterpart that you're that you're looking down on is actually an aspect of you, mm-hmm. and um, and that's the soul lesson. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I there's some people that say that there's my mentor used to say this. There's twelve soul lessons you have to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, I I you know I, I that kind of formula I don't really resonate with it very much. Uh-huh. Um, I think those things are individualistic. As a transpersonalist, I believe that you come into this life and choose beforehand the challenges that you're going to have, mm-hmm. which is a portion of the energies that you want to clear up, resolve, soul lessons that you want to achieve. Mm-hmm. You select that beforehand. And then, and, and you select the childhood with the parents and the circumstances that will elicit that, that will elicit the conditions where you have those challenges and, and you're meant to solve them. Mm-hmm. So there's always a theme of lessons in life? Yes, there is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it would be helpful if you know what those lessons are, right? Uh, it is, and that's why we do so-called past life regressions, is uh-huh. what is the theme? Almost always when you uh, explore three, I, I find three just works really well, Um, three other lives and I'm saying other because I'm allowing for future lives as well Mm -hmm. Um, you will very clearly almost always Mm -hmm. see the theme and what is the theme that you brought into this life and and once you once you perceive once you apprehend that theme Mm -hmm. then it makes it much easier to wrestle with the soul lesson that you uh, that you created for yourself you know to learn I find it interesting that when we know what our lesson is, we might be able to approach our goal in a very different way. Otherwise, we might be repeating the same lessons over and over in different lifetimes. Absolutely. So there is a gal that uh, that she um, she had trouble in her marital relationship, mm-hmm. and. She had circum. This was in a workshop. She had circumstances where she came up as she related it. She says, "Well, this was nothing." Mm-hmm. And she, as she related it, she had three strong male lives uh, in this workshop. And I said, "Look, here you've got three strong male lives. You're a very strong woman in this life, mm-hmm. and your problem is in the relationship." you're not allowing the feminine, the right brain, mm-hmm. to be a part of this relationship. Mm-hmm. And there, that's the source of the conflict with your husband. And it was just clear as a bell. Right. Um, so, yes, seeing the past is, is um, very, very helpful. Mm-hmm. And it's not that it's absolutely necessary. It's not that it's a cure-all, mm-hmm. but it crystallizes why you have the challenge that you have in this life. Right, it gives you more data point to figure out what's happening. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes it solves the problem for you, sometimes it doesn't, but it always provides really good insight. Mm -hmm. It also gave you insights from a perspective that is outside of the ego, is it? Well, I don't know if I agree with that. Yes, each life has its own ego structure mm-hmm. that it developed in that life mm-hmm. because the ego is designed to navigate material reality. It's not designed to control it. It's not designed to be in charge, but it's designed to be the interface. And uh, so each life, quote, so-called past life, has an ego structure that lived that life. But the understanding and seeing all those lives is is a right brain function, is a non-ego function. Because the insight then goes beyond ego. It goes beyond the ego of the particular life now and beyond the egos of the other lives. And that's when, in fact, you're operating at a higher level, when you get that insight and that understanding. The beauty of the regression is uh, you're transcending beyond the ego because you're looking at other ego versions that you've had in the past or the future, whatever those lives are. Right. And, and by stepping beyond the present ego mm-hmm. to see, oh yes, here's the dynamic, mm-hmm. um, you're actually operating beyond ego. And, that, and I think that's 
that's why you come up with a solution. That's why you get beyond the problem. Because the problem, the problem is always resolved. The problem is always one of the ego. Mm -hmm. Right. In the current life, yeah. Right. Can you also talk about guide, like in regression? You can call up a guide to help you gain more understanding about the issues. Okay, so um, it's it's interesting. There are regressionists out there that feel like calling calling up a guide is cheating, uh-huh. and uh, because you go, well, you want the individual discovered. You don't want that guide to to um, to solve the problem for you. For okay. Solve solve in quotes, uh-huh. and. Uh, Here's the reality, and I feel here's the perspective they don't have. Mm-hmm. We are made up of many facets of selves, mm-hmm. many, and these selves. So, some once some channel material, and I believe this is true, says there is no level in which you do not exist. That is, at the same time, you, the individual, are existing in physical reality. There's portions of you physical. You, existing in all the physical realms you know as spiritual as high if that you want to use that metaphor as you can understand at this level and <clears throat> so i do use guides and then the question is and guides often will provide sometimes it's not startling but it's just articulated in a way where it's very succinct and clear the answer to the question which is always about the ego issues mm-hmm. and and then the question is is okay is that a portion of me or is that my guide mm-hmm. and the answer to that question is like all paradoxes mm-hmm. and paradoxes lead you to, to, to knowledge lead you to truth the answer is yes mm-hmm. to that question it is you, a portion of you, mm-hmm. and it also can be a portion that is outside you. Mm-hmm. You see, the con- the arrangements, it's like the Seth material says, there is no limit to the configurations, this isn't the word he used, but I'll use it, mm-hmm. configurations that consciousness can take. Mm-hmm. So consciousness is, you know, we, we've necked down <clears throat> the individual in physical reality to such a degree right. that uh, Bashar, for example, says, I have never seen such masters of limitations. Mm-hmm. You will eventually graduate with a master's in limitations mm-hmm. because we've necked down and given up so much of the inherent power that we have mm-hmm. to come into physical reality, to have this finely focused experience. Mm-hmm. Well, when you open up that aperture and see the rest of the self, there's no limit to the arrangements that you can have. So at the same time that you are yourself, you can be the guide, you can be allied with the guide, Mm -hmm. you can have arrangements that we can't even conceive of right now, Mm -hmm. and still be yourself. Right. And so, um, so I don't have a problem with going to another aspect of yourself to say, hey, give us some insight on this. Right, because the key is to get out of your ego to gather different insights. That's right, and, and at that moment, they are exactly doing that. Right. Because the ego is the most narrow, limited portion of the self that is, period. Mm-hmm. And when you realize that, then you go, okay, I'm open to information from other aspects of me. Mm-hmm. And that's when consciousness expands, and that's really the point. And the context of free will include all that. So you're really making a decision at the whole self level, not just the ego self. Yeah, I love it. Nice, nice, nice statement. Yep. So in regression, when you bring that larger awareness into your present self, you have in fact expanded the boundary of your ego. You're right. Even even simply experiencing one other life, you have in fact transcended the limitations in that moment mm-hmm. of your ego mm-hmm. which is which is focused on this life alone right. at that moment you've expanded into the inner self into the bigger self mm-hmm. and and the more you do that the more powerful it is for you mm-hmm. because because you ha- you have to draw the conclusion and you will that this portion of me is actually just the smallest part of who I really am. Right. And that changes everything. Right. I 
find it interesting that we were made to forget everything that is beyond this life when we first came into this world. Yet our first lesson in life, before things even get meaningful, is to re-remember all that. It is. Yeah. And of course the reason you forget is if you if you had the insight of all of it at, at the beginning, the soul lessons that you're working on, you you wouldn't take them seriously. You wouldn't, you know, it's like it's like being in a movie, you're the character and you already know the outcome. Well, the process of getting to the outcome, you won't be involved in it. You won't be into it. And so our uh, rule in this particular reality is forget who you are. But the process of solving the issues is remembering who you are. That's the paradox. That's There's so many paradoxes. That's another one. So my last question is, if there's one thing we should remember, what is the most important thing we should remember about free will? The, one of the most powerful insights you can have in three-dimensional reality is to understand that in a real sense, you create it. And in a very real sense, what physical reality shows you is aspects of yourself. It is intended to show you where your belief structures, and your belief structures are your power, mm -hmm. where your belief structures are faulty and not serving the greater self. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of it. And, and the conclusion of not having free will is a faulty conclusion. It, mm -hmm. uh, that one will lead to pain. If you understand your free will, you cannot be a victim. Mm -hmm. So knowing that we have free will, we cannot truly really begin our journey in life. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for discussing this important topic with us. Okay. It's fun.